Hey everyone, this is Neo from the Overclocker magazine. I know it's been a while, but I'm back once again and hoping to be back more often. But anyway, let's get right to it. So today I have for you the ROG Strix B550E Gaming. So this is the, I think the most premium B550 motherboard you can get actually from Asus X, outside of the XE model of this one. So let's start off with the price. It's a $269 motherboard, or I think you can get it at Woodware for $5,899. But anyway, if you look at the difference between this motherboard and the cross hair board there's a huge price gap so you're basically getting the most premium p550 experience that ROG is willing to offer you at this price and for that it's actually not a bad offering so with it being a premium product there are certain things that you're going to get with this board one of which is uh i think it's a 14 plus 2 phase power design i don't have the exact details on this but i think it uses uh, two power stages per phase and each power stage i think is about 50 amps but then again don't quote me on this i'm not really sure of what controller it is but i know it's an asp controller a 2000 series or something of the sort i don't have again i don't have actual information on this controller that said usually i want a postcode led or almost all the time i want a postcode led for diagnosing potential issues and that sort of thing so i had one issue where the i think the first row or the first column rather of usb uh, ports had it so that my mouse would skip or have some sort of delay i think switching to the latest bios sorted out this issue as i haven't experienced it since However, I again, don't confirm that, okay? Because I just moved to the other USB ports and stopped using those problematic ones in the first row. So talking further about USB, I think there's a shortage of actual USB ports on this motherboard. So you get four, which are USB 2, right? And then you get another four, which are USB 3.2, two of which are type A and the other two are type C. The The placement of these USB ports, there's just so few of them, I'd like to have seen more. But literally outside of that USB issue with the mouse movement that I was telling you about and just the shortage of USB ports, I have no issues with this motherboard. In fact, if we talk aesthetically, I think this is one of the most eye-pleasing motherboards I've come across in a while, particularly for a mid-range product. Uh, if you look at how RGB started like probably over a decade ago now, it always looked like a unicorn had just thrown up on the motherboard, but now it's done tastefully. And it's actually done with some nuance. I think the less RGB we have, or rather the more tasteful the RGB implementation, the better the motherboards look. And this is one such fine example of a really good looking motherboard. So visually, I have really no issues with this. I think the black on black with the tints of silver and things like that, I think that really works for me. So if you care for aesthetics and that sort of thing, this motherboard will definitely work for you. It's no, it's not a Maximus 12, right? But for the price that you're paying and given that it could look a whole lot worse, I think this is a, a winner. Asus really put together, or ROG rather, put together a real winner here visually. Okay, so talking about cooling on the motherboard. So the VR, the power circuitry cooling on this motherboard is not so advanced. It's actually two separate pieces of heat sink. There were really no issues. It stayed cool enough. It even stayed, stayed cool to the touch. There were, however, two concerning um, readings in hardware info. One always stayed at about 80, 85 degrees or maybe more, and the other one would often be at 90 or so forth. I don't know exactly where these uh, temperature readings are being taken from, but I did try and put a fan across the power circuitry, okay? Um, and it actually didn't make a difference. So I'm not sure where these temperature readings are but they were a little bit concerning however the motherboard performed admirably and i don't i didn't experience any stability issues or anything of the sort so i i don't know for now i would really not be too concerned about it and in fact um talking about stability i was actually able to get a slightly higher overclock on this motherboard than i was on um on the Aorus b550 so I think it's about 50 megahertz or so. I just couldn't stabilize that. Whereas here I could stabilize 4,650. I could just barely do 4,600 there. But that was before um, the latest BIOS update for that motherboard. So that that could be much of a muchness or nothing at all, actually. Now let's get to the more important thing or thing that I care about, which is obviously performance. And that's the part on this or about this motherboard that actually impressed me. I did not expect it to be this good. Having said that, so with the 5000 series of CPUs on this motherboard, and I think others as well, it becomes apparent that if you go with an F clock that's higher than 1900, 
uh, so with the matching DDR, DDR4 3800 clock, you start to get these Windows hardware errors. So they're not really major. The higher you go up, the more you're gonna get these issues. Sometimes you end up getting serious latency issues as well. However, if you stay, I think at 4,000 and below, so that's an F clock of 2,000 and below, you should be you should be good. I think I picked up one Windows hardware error at 2,000, but that's that was more than acceptable for me, and the performance was still scaling. So I, I, I think I'll keep it at 2,000 if I were to be overclocking. Outside of that, 3,800 works fine with the, obviously the F clock of 1,900 megahertz and everything below works as you would expect it to. Now, here's the cool bit once again. So being able to run 4,000, a DDR4 4000 at one to one with the F clock of 2000, it meant that I got really great uh, DRAM performance. In fact, I think this is the best DRAM performance, at least according to IDA64 that I've ever recorded on any AMD or a yeah, on any AMD platform. So yeah, it speaks to the performance that we can with 5,000 series CPUs. And again, to what this motherboard is able to do when it comes to F clock. Again, this is going to be a combination of your CPU and this motherboard will determine how far you can get, but this particular combination worked well on this motherboard. And yeah, I'm really happy about that. Performance wise, so, I tried everything that is supposedly boost performance on this motherboard. So there are a few uh, PBO uh, tweaks that you can get in the sub menus in the AI tweaker. None of them really helped me do anything that I wasn't already getting before. And the long and the short of it is that just using a manual OC, so just setting a fixed uh, clock frequency and setting the required uh, voltage for that, Okay, you don't really have to mess around with the ASUS multi-core enhancements or any of the PBO enhancements that you get in the submenus, in the AI tweaker submenu. You really don't have to do anything. Uh, in fact, if you're going to do anything to improve performance or to do any sort of overclocking, it's all going to come down to the F clock and the, and what do you call this, the DDR frequency. Outside of that, the DRAM frequency rather. Outside of that, there really isn't much that you're going to do. Again, um, this doesn't mean that these options won't have a function in future, but right now they really don't add much to your performance. In fact, they can actually reduce performance if you tinker too much with them. So if I were you, I would just leave them as they are. Overclocking, manual overclocking, the 5600X that I used got to 4650, which also happened to be the maximum boost clock of the CPU on this motherboard. So I was really, um, I was really happy to find that the six core could do 4650 at about 1.275 volts or something like that. Oh, actually talking about uh, CPU voltage and SOC voltage. So usually, or rather on previous ASUS motherboards, there were quite a few LLC settings. I suppose this was determined by the voltage controller. I'm not sure. So you could go from level one to level eight so now it only goes to it goes from level one all the way just to level five and i found that level four gave me the best stability in terms of um v droop and not overshooting the mark and basically keeping a decent temperature on the cpu as well so level four seems to work for me and using level four and i think 1.2275 volts i could get this 5600x to 4650 megahertz and that was pretty solid. So it gave really great performance. And once again, I had no issues with the power circuitry temperature or any temperature of the sort. Now where I will speak about slight, slightly high temperatures is on the South Bridge or rather on the chipset. Now, depending on what sort of VGA you have, if you have a big graphics card that goes across or over the, 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 the chipset, that heat actually ends up going into your M.2 uh, PCI, uh, PCI Express socket. Now, obviously depending, once again, depending on the VGA you have, this may not be an issue, but for the particular VGA card that I used, it was dumping heat into the chipset and obviously from there, it was going into the M.2 socket. Nothing that the heatsink cannot handle, but it was warmer to the touch than I would have liked. When it comes to just using a motherboard, like taking it out the box and having a great experience with it, um, this B550 Ease Gaming is just something that uh, I must say was one of the easiest motherboards I've ever come across. Like, in fact, when I installed the board, the first thing I did was try overclocking. 
I, I didn't even let it run like by default. I just went all the way to 2000 on the F clock and did the equivalent thing for the memory. And there you go. It worked first time around. I didn't have to do much. So I don't know if this, this would be the case on all other motherboards. Certainly wasn't in my experience, but that's a limit, very limited experience. But that sort of thing just makes me like the motherboard. So I was really pre, I was prepped already to like it just by my first interaction with it. Outside of um, those little things that were a little bit of an issue, like the the the, the warm M.2 socket by the South Bridge and the weird mouse movement, there really isn't anything that I would dislike about this motherboard. In fact, at the going price, once again, two sixty nine dollars or five thousand eight hundred and ninety nine at Woodware, it's a fair it's it's a fair motherboard. It's a fair ask, and if you consider what you would get by going to a crosshair, for instance. Uh, versus this you're actually not losing much by staying here everything that you could use on a crosshair is meaningful of course but if you're talking about just purely gaming and extracting the best performance from your cpu i think this motherboard is just as good as that yeah you're going to have to sacrifice you are sacrificing pci express 4.0 on the chipset but again given the price difference i think this is a really great uh, value for money proposition and I think right now this just may be my favorite B550 motherboard, at least in the ATX form factor. There are two mini ITX boards that um that I hope to bring to you pretty soon, like a uh, head-to-head, and those may those may end up being one of those at least may end up being my most favorite B550 offering. But right now I think that the B550e gaming from ROG Strix is the one I would go for. If I was in the market for a B550 board that's actually affordable, performs well, overclocks like a beast and looks pretty slick. Anyway, that's it for me from now. Let me know what you think below. Remember to share, like, subscribe and I'll see you guys pretty soon. Take care and peace.